so I'm going to talk about uh, disability programs and a specific one, the VA's disability uh, uh, program. The paper that I'm presenting represents joint work with uh, David Otter at MIT, Kyle Greenberg, who's a graduate student at MIT, but also at the U.S. Military Academy, and uh, David Lyle, who's also at the U.S. Uh, Military Academy, West Point. Uh, and so I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly, uh, the, the sort of overview, because I only have 25 minutes. So um, most everyone in this room knows that there are disability programs in the U.S. to help guard against the risk that people are unable to work. Uh, Social Security Disability Insurance is the one that's been studied the most, and many people in this room have done great work on the effect of this program. People like uh, Mary Daly and Nicole Maestas, and I'm sure many others here in this room. Uh, supplemental Security Income, uh, uh, these two programs between them insure, uh, provide benefits right now to about 13 million non-elderly adults in the U.S. There is a small number who are on both programs. And then uh, the third program, the VA's Disability Compensation Program, has been studied hardly at all by economists, despite being a pretty large program and uh, growing quite rapidly. So today, that's what I'll be uh, talking about. Um, the fraction of non-elderly adults in all three of these programs has been increasing rapidly uh, for uh, years now, for about 30 years. And there are many factors that have contributed to that. Uh, demographics is certainly one of them. Uh, but I think a key reason that I've shown in previous research and co-authors and many uh, others uh, is the change in the program's medical eligibility criteria, a broadening of that criteria. Um, there's been a big academic literature that studied the effect of Social Security disability insurance. Um, and SSDI is quite different from the VA program that I'll be talking about today. One important respect in which that's true is the benefits are all or nothing. You either get onto disability or you don't. Uh, and the program I'll be talking about today is quite different from that. It's also true that benefits depend on past earnings. So if a person had really high earnings throughout their life, they'd get much more in benefits from SSDI than someone who, let's say, had worked at the minimum wage throughout their life. That's not true for the program I'll be studying today. SSI is just the means-tested version of SSDI, but the uh, past research on SSDI and to some extent SSI have uh, focused mainly on the question of what effect do they have on labor supply, which is to say, in the absence of the program or in the absence of being enrolled in the program, would people otherwise be working? Really hard answer that for the myriad endogeneity reasons that everyone here can uh, is, is probably quite familiar with um, but it's difficult uh, to, and it is difficult to estimate the effect of the program because it is a federal program uh, that's why some of the work that Nicole has recently done and others has been really innovative and has really uh, moved moved the ball forward on this front um, but there's really just so little research that's explored these same sorts of effects uh, for the disability compensation program. There's actually this handbook chapter in the public economics by Bound and Burkhauser in which they, uh, it's called the, the effects of economic, the economic effects of transfer programs targeted at people with disabilities. And they cite 55 papers, I think, that are, that look at SSDI. I don't know, 15 or so that look at SSI and there's zero that look at disability compensation. So we're trying to fill that gap a bit. And our paper today is highly imperfect, but we're hoping to push things forward. Uh, the program pays benefits to veterans with conditions that were caused or aggravated during their service. And veterans can apply at one of 56 uh, VA regional offices. And they often apply with multiple conditions. They might have six different conditions. They have a, a really bad scar. Uh, their hearing is off. And perhaps they have other conditions as well. So they can apply with like six conditions. And they may get ratings. They may get rated for three of them turned down for three, and then they can sort of appeal the ratings of certain ones not high enough, the ratings of the rejected ones they think they should be rated, and all of this feeds into what's called a combined disability rating. Um, and that combined disability rating determines what their monthly benefits are. Um, and DC recipients can apply for an increase in their ratings. So there's basically 10 different levels, 10, 20, 30 percent, all the way up to 100 percent. And uh, recipients can apply for an increase in their ratings if they either disagree with the decision that was made or if their conditions get uh, uh, more serious. In general, when people appeal, they tend not to appeal that the rating was too high. So they, uh, it, it tends to be so that, 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 uh, that. So here you can get a sense of the monthly benefit schedule. So for someone with a 10% rating, let's say they're only getting about $140 a month, but someone with a 100% rating is getting almost $3,000 a month. And if you add in a spouse, there's extra benefits if you have a spouse, extra benefits for each kid, and so forth. There are various adjustments to this. 
Um, and so if you look at enrollment in the program, so in the U.S., just to sort of orient your mind, there are about 22 million veterans in the U.S. Okay, so almost 4 million of them are enrolled in this program. So about 18% of veterans are on this program. 13 years ago, before the policy change that we're studying today, that was 9%. So it has actually more than doubled over the course of 13 years after remaining pretty flat for 50 years. Um, and so we'll be talking about that. Total expenditures on the program are now north for 50 year, fiscal year 14, they'll definitely be north of 50 billion. Just to get a sense, EITC is sort of in the neighborhood of 65 or 70 billion. So it's a pretty big program in terms of expenditures. Uh, the average monthly benefit is pretty similar to the benefit for SSDI at 1100. Benefits are not subject to federal income or payroll tax. And the benefit schedule is indexed to the consumer price index. So that thing that I showed you before, the benefit for a 20% rating, a 60% rating, and so forth, are pegged to the CPI. Uh, and the, uh, the, the program is structured different, somewhat differently from SSDI and SSI in the sense that you don't necessarily have to show that you're unable to work. Let's suppose that you've uh, both, I, I, uh, I know a veteran who lost both of his legs above the knee uh, in uh, service and he works, but he is uh, rated at 100%. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the case that you are uh, unable uh, to work. Um, and it is, um, uh, so it, for many recipients, it represents a pure income effect. Though I'll talk about, it's not exactly true for everyone because if you have a disability rating between 60 and 90% and you are unable to work, you can apply for getting 100% benefit, what's called an unemployability rating. And about 10% of people on the program, even though they don't have 100% rating, they get the benefit of 100% because of this individual unemployability rating. Okay, so it's the policy change that we're looking at in this study uh, basically expanded the, uh, uh, the medical eligibility criteria for our veterans who had served in the Vietnam theater during the conflict there between 1964 and 1975. Um, in Vietnam, the US military used Agent Orange and a number of other herbicides uh, to defoliate uh, basically trees. Uh, and there was a lot of concern among veterans when they returned about the possible health effects of this. Uh, there was a national, there was a lot of activity on this front in the 70s, in the 80s, and the 90s, and this culminated in a National Institute of Medicine report in 2000 that linked exposure to Agent Orange potentially to diabetes. Now, obviously, you can't very well randomize people to Agent Orange exposure or not, and so the papers were basically, you can imagine, OLS regressions. On the left, do you have diabetes? On the right, did you work in a plant, let's say, that manufactured Agent Orange? And uh, they saw there, and the evidence was, um, it, it's, it's not the case that people who hadn't been exposed to it had a prevalence of 0% in diabetes, let's say that. Um, so they basically, in July of 2001, the VA added diabetes to the list of conditions for which uh, service connections would be pre presumed for Vietnam veterans. And you can imagine for all, so it's difficult to figure out is a person disabled or not in many cases. Some cases it's not. Cancer, let's say for SSDI, there's a test, the person has cancer or not, the person's had a stroke or not, but for many conditions it's somewhat blurry. You add in another layer with the VA program, which is, is this service connected or not? Okay, so diabetes had kind of been assumed, no, this is not service connected, and then it was added. For people who had served during the Vietnam era in the Vietnam theater, which concluded Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and about 40% of Vietnam era veterans served uh, uh, in that theater. And so uh, soon after that, DC enrollment, disability compensation enrollment among Vietnam era veterans surged. This also coincided, by the way, with this happened in 2001, right around the time of 9-11. There are a lot of other changes uh, going on and, and enrollment among other veterans uh, was growing around that time too. But in any case, you can see from this figure, uh, basically right here, that's when the policy changed and that's the number of people receiving disability compensation back to 1950. So here we're going through the Korea War, pretty flat. We go through the Vietnam War, it increased somewhat. Pretty flat in the 80s and 90s. And then in 2001, the thing took off. Okay, 2001, we had uh, about 20% more veterans than we have today. And yet the number of people on disability compensation is 70% higher. So that is a pretty big uh, change. Um, and if you look at it as a fraction of all veterans, so during the 70s and the 80s, we're talking about sort of around 8%, drifting up somewhat in the 90s, 
by 2000 to about 9%, and it is now north of 18%. Um, so this is a pretty uh, big change in a relatively short time period. And if you look at this among Vietnam era veterans, you can see prior to 1967, VA didn't designate people as Vietnam era veterans yet, but as soon as 68, they started designating them about 2% of people who had left and served in Vietnam were on the program, and this thing sort of drifted up to about 9% also by 2001, and then it doubles in this time period. So it is, uh, this, is that, this is what we're going to be about today. We're going to exploit that as a source of variation with which to estimate the effect of the program. Okay? And so you can think about a sort of standard analysis of labor force participation. It could be any number. This could be a health outcome. This could be earnings. We're just going to say, let's say labor force participation for person J in period T. You can think about putting a bunch of characteristics for the person in their age, their gender, their you know, education, what have you. Okay? And then this indicator for are they enrolled in the disability compensation program. Well, complicating this is it's not really just one program. As I showed you, it's like 10 different programs, 10%, 20%. So let's just abstract from that for right now. Okay? So, but the problem with this kind of an equation if I tried to go into the current, current population survey and estimate this, is there a million other things that aren't in the data that are correlated with disability compensation enrollment? So how am I going to interpret an estimate for gamma in a causal way? I might have a correlation, but it's hard to estimate it causally. So what we're going to try to do is look at the time pattern of disability compensation enrollments of veterans who had served in Vietnam with other veterans serving around the same time who had not served in Vietnam. So we're going to try to use other veterans as a comparison group. And we're going to look at the time pattern of DC enrollment and the time pattern of labor force participation and basically see if we see a break in both around the same time. Okay? It's not perfect because you know, we like comparing veterans to other veterans. We think that's better than comparing them to non-veterans. But still, if you served in Vietnam, that's a different experience than not serving in Vietnam. So we're going to try to adjust for that. But we're going to try to see if outcomes change differentially after 2001 for uh, the bug. Okay, and we've got factors here that include things like race by year indicators, age by year indicators. Okay, we're going to look because we're going to people are aging, so we'd expect people to be dropping out of the labor force. We're sensitive to the possibility that just the very fact that you served in Vietnam may make your optimal retirement date earlier than it would be if you hadn't served in Vietnam. So we're going to try to control for all this AFQT quintiles and so forth uh, in the paper. And so for this, we're merging administrative data from four federal agencies. Uh, the US Army's Office of Me Economic and Manpower Analysis is the sort of, this is the thing we start with. Okay? They have a near census of veterans who left the Army between 1968 and 1985, virtually all of whom are men. Um, and so it's a sample of 4.1 million veterans, though about a third of them start after 1976, so they're not uh, candidates for our analysis. They're not <clears throat> serving in the Vietnam era. And we have incomplete coverage in the early part of the Vietnam era. So I told you this was 64 to 75. If you left, let's say, the Army in 67, you're not going to be in our data. Okay? So we've, we're going to tend to have Vietnam era veterans who are a little younger than the typical Vietnam era veteran. 4.1 million veterans. We merged this to data from the National Center for Health Statistics, their death master file, that goes through the end of 2006. <clears throat> we have VA data on uh, disability compensation enrollment, the combined disability uh, rating, and the benefit level, individual unemployability, diagnoses, and so forth for 1998 through 2006. So we're going to look at five years of data after this policy change. And, uh, the final thing is that we're merging this to Social Security Administration data. Now, making our lives somewhat difficult is that to get earnings data, you can't get individual level earnings data. So we had to group individuals into cells of five to nine observations. And with that, we have these variables like fraction with zero earnings, average earnings, maximum, minimum. I think it's possible that we can reconstruct all of the individual earnings with because we have like 11 statistics and they're out of but, but you can't know what a person's earnings are, and so they have these cells. Now, initially, when we first did, we actually have revived this paper. This paper was around a while ago. Some of you may have seen it a while ago. 
and SSA had required a match on the social security number, the last name, and the date of birth. And OEMA, Office of Economic and Manpower Analysis, initially, their data wasn't great on last names. They had kind of scribbled them down. And so our match rate was initially terrible. But we had SSNs, we had dates of birth. They also required last names. So we cr contracted with a credit agency with TransUnion to get accurate name info, and our match rate went up dramatically as a result. And so now we're finally revisiting this after getting that data, okay? So up here, this is just showing when people left the Army. And you're going to see that the BOG veterans, we refer to them as people who had boots on the ground. NOG veterans did not have boots on the ground. Our BOG veterans tend to have loss years, meaning they left the Army, in the sort of 69, 70, 71, 72 period. We've got a lot of people in the NOG who like left in 1985, for example. They're not really uh, in our sample. Similarly, if you look at the year of birth, and I, you know, with so little time, I don't, I'm just going to try to tell you what is the key takeaway. So years of birth, we're going to end up telescoping in on people born 1946 to 1951, okay? because we don't have great coverage for older people. And the uh, younger people are less likely to have served, very unlikely to have served in theater. Um, but just so you have a sense of how big is this population. So if you look at men born in 1948 today, more than half of them served in the military. Okay, so more than half of, and about a third of men in their 60s right now are veterans. So this is a big group potentially affected by this program, and about 40% of Vietnam era veterans served in the Vietnam theater. So I'm going through, like, here's the sample. Are they comparable? That's not perfect. Um, but you can see that the fraction non-white between the BOG and the NOG is pretty similar. The education stuff is part of the problem with education is we get a snapshot at enlistment. So people's ultimate education is likely to be a lot higher. That's not a great variable. But we have things like, uh, uh, so there's a lot of, the, the two groups look pretty comparable on their baseline characteristics. One thing to note, though, right at the outset, and a challenge for us in this, is that the baseline rates of disability compensation enrollment are about twice as high in the BOG than in the NOG at baseline, likely reflecting the fact that it, being a veteran, if you served in Vietnam, that was a tougher experience than if you haven't served in Vietnam. Okay, so we're gonna, all else equal, you'd prefer to have your, two, your sort of treatment and control group identical on everything, and then, you know, so they're not, and that is, uh, and so you can get a sense of, uh, one thing that I sort of alluded to, so there's this benefit schedule. Often people will apply, they'll get an award, and what this figure up here looks at is it asks, let's take the very first number, 40.3, it asks, people awarded disability compensation for the first time in 1999. What was their average combined disability rating? 40% it was, okay? Now let's follow them, okay? Let's see what happens to the evolution of their combined disability rating. Because as I said, you can appeal. You can appeal for increases in the benefits. And so it slides up gradually from 40 to about 60%. Because the benefit schedule is convex, what that means, and this is inflation adjusted, that the monthly benefit goes from 900 in your first year on the program to 1650 just five, uh, seven years later. Okay, so this escalator is, you know, makes the program interesting, but somewhat more complicated to uh, estimate the effects. Okay, so there's this rapid escalator in benefits. And you can see that the, um, a lot receive this individual unemployability award. You can also look at the fraction receiving compensation for diabetes. So, you know, they're one out of 200 awardees, even before the policy change, were getting awarded for diabetes. So it's not like it never happened, okay? But if you look in, two, this is 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, if you look at new awardees, almost 60% of them had diabetes as one of their conditions. So that thing that we saw with the enrollment taking off, this is driven by a growth in diabetes awards. So you can see here, this is DC enrollment in the BOG relative to the NOG. So here's this big difference at baseline. So not ideal for us. I would prefer that those two things be the same, but you know, they're sort of trending comparably. And then you see the BOG sort of take off. And also there, you know, as anyone who's worked with this sort of data knows, I have no doubt that some of the people we classify as NOG are actually BOG. So you're like, it, our data isn't perfect, but at the Army's done, I think, an incredibly good job of sort of, compa of uh, you know, assigning people accurately uh, to this. But there's likely a little bit of slippage in the data on that front. 
So you can see this, uh, but if you look at the, this is just raw rates of disability compensation enrollment. By the end of the period, about 23% in the VOG versus 7.6, so more than three times by the end of the period versus about twice early on in the period. Higher growth among non-white than among white. Um, and the percent receiving compensation for diabetes. So this is what I mean why I think there's a little bit of slippage, because even in the NOG, we see a little bit of an increase in the fraction uh, getting an award with diabetes. Okay, so it's not, I think there is a little bit of slippage in the data, um, but you can see that there's this pretty dramatic change. So if you look at the percent of veterans getting on with a diabetes award, if you look at the BOG versus the NOG, you see basically both are zero in 2000, okay, whereas it grows enormously among the BOG. And if you take that out, if you take out diabetes awards and look at how disability compensation enrollment evolves, those two trends stay pretty parallel, right? Big difference in baseline, but pretty parallel. Okay, so the summary of just the enrollment results, and a lot of what I'm gonna be doing is in figures just because of the, the time stuff. DC enrollment at baseline was about seven percentage points higher in the BOG. That would have grown to eight or 9% in the absence of this policy change, but instead it grew to about 15% by the end, 15 percentage points by the end of the time period, okay? And so and the effects vary by race, by low versus high FQT and so forth. And here, this is just a regression version of this thing right here, which is just disability compensation on the left as a function of an indicator for are you in the BOG times year dummies. Okay, so we've got year dummies, and we also have BOG times year dummies, and we see this differential growth for the BOG. And this thing looks similar for people born 46 to 47, for people born 48 to 49, for people born 50 to 51. Because a reasonable concern would be, well, there's something about having served in Vietnam. When you hit 55, something happens, but that wouldn't explain why they all pivot right at this time. And we're gonna find that same kind of thing for labor supply. And this is just doing that same regression. Instead of having nine parameters, estimate just three. A baseline difference, that's the 8.1. A pre-existing trend, that's the 0.399. And the break-in trend after 2001, that's the 1.0. So that's a 1.0 percentage point difference in the break-in trend. That's an acceleration. Um, what's unfortunate for us is we have these snapshots in September of 2001. The policy changed July 2001. We treat September 2001 as pre. It's a little bit post. Like you can see the thing already starting to get affected, but we just, so this isn't as, we wish the snapshots were in June instead of September. So now what happens with labor force participation? So this is, a, here you can see, it is lower among the BOG than among the NOG. It is trending down. That trend seems to accelerate after 2001, okay? So you can see 2001, this is the last period, if you sort of just trace it out, okay, it would end up if it continued. Now the identifying assumption of our approach, the, if there's one, it is that whatever the trends were pre-2001, they would have continued. So we've got two problems. Levels are different between the two groups. Trends are different between the two groups. In general, if you, anyone's doing like a difference and difference kind of analysis, you'd like neither of those to be true. You'd like levels to be the same and trends to be the same. We're gonna control for those different levels and different trends, and so we see a big break in that trend. Okay, but that is, you know, that's a limitation. So if you do a regression version of this, you can see baseline rates of labor force participation, which we define here to be zero earnings. Okay, so that isn't a perfect definition of labor force participation. We have the advantage of large, you know, there's pluses and minuses with administrative data. You get a lot of people, but the variable you get may not be exactly the one you want. In any case, we see a bigger baseline difference, a pre-trend, labor force participation was falling more rapidly among the BOG even prior to 2001. And here, by the way, we're able to go all the way back to 1996. For DC, and we can even go back before 1996. We can go back to 80 if we want. Um, so you can see it's trending down, okay? Um, and then that, but that accelerates. That minus 0.181 means that trend basically more than doubles Okay? And what you see is it's not, if I did that figure for these three different year of birth cohorts, we would see the same kind of pattern, the same kind of break around the same time. So you know, I, you know, when, I, when we were first doing this project, people said, well, how are you gonna account for the fact that Vietnam veterans may have just retired early anyways, or for, for other reasons? 
Bigger, by the way, change for non-whites than for whites. Bigger change for low AFQT than for high AFQT. Okay, so the summary of these results, if you take the ratio of two, those two parameters, which is by no means perfect, we're just scratching the surface. The fun thing about being one of the first to study a program is you can just, you know, <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot going on here. So our, if you take the ratio of those two trend break things, it suggests that one in five newly on this program is dropping out of the labor force, which is comparable, actually, to estimates that Nicole has come up with for SSDI. Um, now, part of this effect, though, may be dri driven by promotions among incumbents, people who are already on the program, so we don't have a great answer for that. Maybe we will at some point. We see a similar break in trend for the log of mean earnings, a spillover to SSDI benefits. So part of what we see, people get VA, disability, and now they apply for SSDI, okay? Now here are the trend, though, the pre-trend here. So this is log earnings. You can see it even more sharply here, suggesting we're not just getting extensive margin, but we're getting some intensive margin too. Now SSDI is a little tougher. There's a pre-trend here. BOG is growing more rapidly than NOG, but you see it pivot around soon after uh, 2001. And this, you know, once again, it could be an age thing, but we break it out by different uh, birth cohorts, and it looks similar there. So, so I think the results here, and I know that I'm, I'm coming up on, uh, uh, I just hit 25 minutes, the findings take on uh, additional significance, I think, when we think about what is happening in the US with labor force participation. So if we look back in early 2008, the labor, and I get that there's like demographic changes and others, so I'm not saying that what we observe in this figure is the VA's disability compensation program. But if you look, in early 2008, 66% was the labor force participation rate. This past jobs report had the lowest labor force participation rate in decades, 62.7, 3.3 percentage point difference. If you moved 62.7 today to 66.0, that would be 8.3 million more people in the labor force. I could have put the same thing up for employment rate, which fell a lot and has been flat. So all of the decline, essentially, in unemployment is this. So the decline from 10 percentage points to 6 percentage points, virtually all this. And I get that there's demographic changes underlying this, but I think understanding what effect the sort of medley of tax and transfer programs has on labor supply is important as we think about this and where it is headed in the future. Uh, so for people like, you know, for, for others to think about, is this thing going to recover or is it going to continue or is it going to uh, stop uh, declining. And I think I just want to make one pitch for really quickly. Oh, this didn't uh, format this. So you can just imagine some of those numbers aren't tabbed over enough. But this is a new paper with Courtney Coyle, Audrey Guo, who's here, who's a second year PhD student in uh, Stanford's uh, uh, PhD program. We're presenting this at the AEA. This is going to be a P and Papers and Proceedings paper. And we, I've extended this to look at veterans more broadly, not just Vietnam era veterans with boots on the ground. Okay, and so if you look, it used to be true in the 80s and the 90s that if you look, let's say, at men and you controlled for age and you controlled for race and you controlled for whether they were Hispanic, that labor force participation was higher among veterans than among non-veterans. Okay? So remember that figure where in 2001 things broke. Beginning in 2000, so I broke this up into seven years, 35 years of March CPS data. It's basically positive for 20 years. In the 2000, from 2000 forward, this thing is negative. Negative by 0.85 percentage point. This is all veteran males 25 to 64 years old. Negative by minus one, by 1.7 1 percentage points. Different by 4.3 percentage points in the five most recent March CPSs. Driven quite a lot by veterans who are in their 55 to 64 years. Eight percentage points lower in labor force participation among veteran males than among non-veteran males. Look back 20 years ago, it was 1.6 percentage points higher. So what we, I think what we're uncovering is there's an effect of this program. And in fact, part of what Courtney, Audrey, and I are looking at is what's happening with some of the younger veterans who served their GWOT Global War on Terror veterans who served since 2001. For them, for this group, there usually wasn't much of a difference, 25 to 34 years old. You look today, 4.3 percentage points less likely to be in the labor force 
than their non-veteran uh, counterparts. So we think that this program is a potentially uh, big factor in understanding what's ha happening in the labor market uh, for, uh, for especially men in the US. So I will uh, uh, wrap up there. <clears throat> So just go with this. You're all set. Yep. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss uh, a paper at this conference. And I always appreciate a chance to read work that Mark's done, especially when he's done it with uh, David, although not exclusively when he's done it with David, because they are almost always going to use a clever technique or a, a new data source to answer what I consider a fundamental question that the literature continues to struggle with. And in this case, the, it's exactly the same. So the big question that they're struggling with or they're asking is, do disability benefits broadly, I think that's the big question, affect labor supply? Now there's casual, not causal, casual evidence in support of an effect that goes all the way back to the 1960s, where you see an increase in, I mean, a, a, almost a, a continuous decline in labor force participation among prime age males, 25 to 64, and you see a coincident increase in disability benefits awarded through the SSDI system. So this is the share of men on the program. This kind of casual evidence was formalized, if you will, by Don Parsons in a famous, now famous 1980 uh, paper in the JPE. Either most of you read it when, we were, when it came out or you read it in graduate school. But it was a, it's a well-known paper in which um, Don basically is saying, look, I can formalize this relationship and I conclude in my paper that the decline in labor force participation that we see among males is associated with programs in general, but in particular SSDI. Now, why are we here today talking about this work? Well, because not everyone agreed with Don's work, as you might recall. And that began 30 or more years of research. Many graduate students did dissertations on this, and we have a whole other wave of people still studying this. So what's really at the heart? And this is why I'm going through this a little bit, because I want to put Mark and David's paper in context for you, saying it's not just a cool experiment. It's actually on a fundamental topic that's very difficult to get at. And Mark alluded to, or stated it specifically, why it's hard to get the answer, but I want to just review it. Why is it so difficult to know whether the SSDI programs had an effect on labor supply? Well, the biggest problem is that the SSDI system is an all or nothing program, as Mark said. You're either on it or you're not, and you only get on it when you are deemed unable to work in the labor market. So what does this mean in practice? Well, it means that you, uh, can't, you have to be out of the labor force, not working, for six months in advance of your application. While your application is being adjudicated, which can take you know, two or more years, you cannot work. When you get a benefit, if you're awarded, you can try to work, but very few people do. And in fact, John Bounds done work that suggests that very few people who get rejected go back to work. But it's difficult to know which of the various things could be driving that. One possibility is that people are in such poor health, they have such a severe disability, that they can't work. The second possibility is they have skills that have so depreciated, they've so invested in not being in the labor force, it's extremely difficult to get back in. And the third is that there's this, if you get on the benefit program, there's this labor supply effect. So it's hard to know which one is true. And why, you might think if you're, an, since most of us in this room are economists, well, of course, it has a labor supply effect. But let me just say that if you're in the Social Security Administration, and here I think I'm mostly going to be speaking for the Chief Actuary's Office, uh, you do not believe there's a labor supply effect. You don't believe there's any behavioral effect. If there, and if you do believe it a little bit, it's a small, small effect. Then if you go to among economists, there's a general admission, if, if my characterization uh, is, or my impression is right, there's a general admission that there's a labor supply effect. But the range of estimates go from pretty small, not even worrisome, to pretty large and probably driving some of the trends in labor force participation we see both among males and increasingly among females. So this is an open debate. And it makes their paper, I think, an important one, not because it's on veterans just, but because it's answering this kind of more fundamental question. So how is the VA problem, uh, disability program going to help? Well, Mark said this, but I think it's worth reviewing, both because it's early in the morning and because he and I both speak fast. So if you hear it twice quickly, you probably heard it once slowly. Uh, so what's different about the VA program? 
Well, the first thing is it doesn't restrict work, except in those special cases uh, where you get this um, individual unemployment or you're not employable. But that's not a very common thing. Uh, so it doesn't restrict work. It's actually not a program made to pro pro um, replace lost earnings. It's a program, the way I think of it, Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a program to say, you're a veteran, you got injured in service or related to service, so we're going to compensate you. Maybe it's going to replace lost earnings, but mostly it's going to compensate you for being injured in the line of duty serving your country. So that's what it's built for. It's a partial disability system, as Mark said, and this is going to be super relevant to my comments about what I'd like to see going forward. It goes from 0% disability, where you just get health insurance, to 100% disability, where you get a full payment, which is pretty sizable. The um, most important thing, I think, that, you, that I want you to remember for the comments I'm going to make is that these uh, CDRs, these uh, combined disability ratings, can increase over time. So in the paper, they call it an escalator effect. And essentially, you get onto the program, you might start at 0 or 10 percent, and you can ratchet this up over time. Largely, as you age, you can go in and say, well, I've got a new condition. It was related to service. It didn't show up yet, but here it is now. And then you get moved up. So you th I think of this program as individuals get on the program, but then they're, they're moving up in the disability rating system over time, and that's coming with an increased uh, payment. And so the monthly earnings, as you, monthly benefit that you're paid is, is linked to the CDR. It's not linked to your past earnings. So the replacement rates of this program will vary not by how much you've earned, not, not by uh, some earnings replacement strategy, but by how much you earned or what your opportunities are in the labor market. So these features, I think, make it possible just generally to link uh, labor supply decisions directly to benefit receipt. In, so this is a zero one variable. That's what I mean by benefit receipt. You're either on the program or you're not. But also to benefit generosity, how lucrative your benefit schedule is as you move up that CDR. But of course, and, and this is what Mark pointed out, you need some exogeneity to really try to get at this causal link. Um, and the clever, this is really the clever part of the paper, in my opinion. They, they're going to exploit, as Mark's already said, so I won't belabor it, this 2001 change that gave a subset of veterans a access to um, disability benefits based on type 2 diabetes. So this subset of veterans is you know, the Vietnam era vets who were, and I'm going to encourage you at the end when I do some editorial comments to your paper, I really, for the layperson, would shift to the layperson not in the veterans program to in theater, out of theater, as opposed to boots on the ground. Plus, it's BOG, which means Board of Governors for me, working at the Fed. So the, uh, it was really, I had to discipline myself. But a common way that people refer to, um, to boots on the ground is in theater and, and not in theater. And I think in this uh, world, it really makes a difference uh, how you think about these things. So they're going to use these in theater versus out of theater, to use my language, comparisons to ask four basic questions. Does, the act, does getting on the program change when these in theater Vietnam era vets get this new uh, allowance on type 2 diabetes? Does, it in, does that getting on the benefit program change their labor force participation? Does it change their earnings? And does it change their SSDI or SSI participation? And they're going to use these, constantly use these relative outcomes, it's, as Mark described well. So I will stop uh, with a description of that. OK. So why is this even nicer than it seems? And you know, it's easy to get bogged down in saying, well, the experiment's not quite right. And, and Mark did a great job of selling you all the reasons it's not quite right. But in many ways, it's really nice. And so not to uh, say it's fantastic, I just want to just call out reasons it's nice. Here's the main reason it's nice, in my opinion. Type 2 diabetes is not a debilitating disease, mostly. So people do work with type 2 diabetes. Lots of people in the population work with it. And so when you're getting a labor supply effect, one of the reasons the Social Security uh, or, uh, Administration pushes back so hard is because they say, well, people are really not able to work. But here's something where we can actually get the labor supply effect more cleanly, because type 2 diabetes doesn't, in it, by definition, prevent you from work. There's a lot of residual work capacity. So we're going to be able to more cleanly get at this question, I think. The second uh, reason it's a cool experiment is the Vietnam War was a sizable war, so we get a lot of people who are both in theater, and then you have this comparison group of out of theater. And then the time period in which the policy change took place was right in the heart of when we start to think about men, in particular, exiting the labor force for disability benefits or early retirement. And so you can get this sort of, these are, these are going to help us answer these fundamental questions that I think go way beyond the veterans program. 
So the gist of their experiment, as Mark showed you, is you get this 2001 change. You get a big spike in enrollments. This is just the number of people in the program. Uh, and you ask the question, well, did this enrollment increase more among the treated than the not treated? And this is just two pictures of, from the paper that show that if you're in theater, meaning you're eligible for the program, and this is percent re receiving the VA disability compensation, that percentage went up for the in theater, but it didn't go up for the not in theater, the, the ineligible. If you then look at the people who got a diabetes award, you again see that if you're eligible for that, you're in theater, you're part of that Vietnam era group, then it went up a lot and it went just barely budged up for the not treated group. So this is the sense in which it looks like this thing did really affect enrollment. In fact, I'm convinced. I think it did affect enrollment. It's hard to argue with that. The regressions just solidify it if you were thinking that they did a good job of matching the control with the experiment group, experimental group. By the time you put it in the regression, you're more or less convinced. So now we want to go back to the big question of the paper, though, is does this enrollment in the program or the generosity of the benefits you receive affect labor supply? Well, the evidence Mark presents in the paper, and, and so talked about here, his answer, I think, would be yes, it does. But I, this is where I have some, some places where I'd like to see you guys go farther in the paper. The question I'm really struggling with as I read the paper, I think about this issue, is what's driving this result? Is it that I'm getting access to the benefits? Is this the zero one variable? So I wasn't on the program, now I'm on the program, and so that changes my labor supply? Or is it that the generosity is changing, and so as the generosity goes up, then I'm more likely to exit the labor market because I have uh, replacement income? And I think that these two aspects of change are potentially distinguishable, but I don't know, I'm not sure and are likely important, then there I'm very sure, or more sure anyway. Um, so I think that this really does matter. And one way to think about what I'm talking about, or to get it to become convinced that there might be something uh, in that comment, is that if you look at this initial graph, these are the percentage with the diabetes award right after 2001. And what you see is the initial uh, takeoff is steeper than the eventual rate. It, uh, growth. And that suggested to me that you've got a mix of people who are escalating, essentially. They were on the program already, and they had a variety of other conditions. But now they get this disability uh, uh, award, and they can ratchet up their CDR, which is going to give them a higher benefit. And that's going to be combined early on. There probably is some pent-up demand, if you will, for this additional benefit because you have a stock of people who are on the program already, and they have di diabetes, and they just get on the program. And that's gonna, it's gonna confound, if you will, that group of people with this uh, new entrance. Now, why is that important? Well, again, this is uh, something from the paper that uh, Mark didn't, well, he showed this and he didn't show the next one, but this is the one he already showed you. Recall that benefits rise with these CDRs. So the higher your CDR, the higher your benefits, and then there's this sharp increase at the end if you get up to 100%. Now, here's what I wanted to say when I said, why does this matter? Here's two pictures he didn't, Mark didn't get time to show today, but I think are relevant for my point. If you looked at the left-hand side, you see existing beneficiaries, and then the right-hand side is new beneficiaries. And I want you to pay attention to the red line. This is the percent of people with, who are existing beneficiaries who uh, in 2006 have a full award, 100%. So this is telling you that 60%, almost 60% of people in 2006 of this group of existing beneficiaries who had a diabetes award had a full award. They started off with like 30%, but they ended up at 60. If you compare them to the new beneficiaries over the same sample frame, so they came in in 2002, now we're in 2006, it's only 30% have a full award. So there's a difference in how many of these people have a full award, and that's going to mean a difference in the income that they're getting from the program. So, if you think that labor supply is not just based, is, is not solely based on whether you're in, entering the program regardless of your payment, but is much more likely to be based on the generosity of the program, then these two facts are kind of confounded in, in the analysis. And it seems plausible to me that individuals could get on the program, let me just take a hypothetical person, a made up person really, they get on the program, they get a 10% disability or 20% disability, they work, 
They continue to work. They continue to every year apply to get the CDR up. And then there's some tipping point, a threshold, when they feel enough of their earnings is replaced. Maybe it's 100%. Maybe it's something lower. And that is the, the thing that's going to cause them to exit the labor force altogether. And I think I'm more convinced that that point could be um, worth, worth thinking about when I saw the two charts that you, you took the regression coefficients and plotted the lines. And you saw a steeper decline in the earnings uh, than you did for the participation. And I'm guessing that this is because you, you first adjust along the intensive margin, and only then do you get to the extensive margin. And so if you could separate these two things, I think you'd get some more traction from this that would be relevant to thinking about disability programs more generally. Um, so that's the big thought I had about the paper that I thought you could, if you did that, it would make it a stronger paper, I think, and more generalizable. Um, I have a few editorial suggestions. I don't know how many of you had a chance to read the paper, so if not, uh, this is going to mostly direct it to Mark. But my uh, one big one I have is that I think some sort of a data schematic that just shows, because you have four data sources, and I studied it hard, and I finally just drew a picture for myself that said, okay, I'm using these data to get the first years to identify the folks, then these many people are leaving, and, and just knowing where, which data I have when in the sample, uh, that you're, or the sample range, I think would be really helpful. Uh, I would eliminate some of the jargon. I don't mean to have a pejorative word there, but there's a lot of terms that are military terms that I don't think are common parlance. Uh, one I already referred to, but even a lost year, I would simply call that exits from the, the military. It's the exit year. And I think there's just some easier terms that would make it a, a, a nicer read. Um, the big th places I'm going to push on, Mark, in terms of expanding the paper is I, I think that this has... Uh, it is a cool experiment, and you don't want to get over, somebody taught me this uh, example, over your skis. You do too far along, you know, beyond what you can really say. But I think this is a literature that is uh, still, can, still muddled. You know, people really, people come in with priors and they leave with the same priors typically, reading the same research paper. So this is an area where if you motivate it that way, it just gives us a little more information than just on the veterans program. And then I would also emphasize the, um, the low wage workers uh, issue because the, those are individuals who are going to have higher replacement rates for these benefits simply because they have uh, fewer work opportunities or high wage opportunities. And this kind of dovetails nicely, I think, with your previous work on the topic. And so I thought that was an area that you could emphasize. Um, I'm going to end with this, hopefully on time. I haven't been watching, but uh, with why you should be really interested in this paper. And, why I think this is an important paper. And it's because the SSA uh, system is, you know, where people are thinking about reforming SSDI and SSI. And one of the, when I'm in DC talking about this, one of the um, options people keep putting forward is let's just go to the VA system. Let's make a partial disability system for everyone on SSDI or SSI. If I'm reading your paper correctly, this would be very um, uh, detrimental to labor force participation. So if we think we have a trou trouble now with male labor force participation, I don't think that that is necessarily going to help. So when we're thinking about this paper, it's really nice to think about it in the context of that type of policy reform. Uh, the final thing I'll leave you with is uh, the concluding paragraph from Don Parson's paper. I'm not advertising for Don. It just happened to be that I saw this. I reminded myself of this paper, and I saw that some of the conclusions he put in are, are still relevant today, at least for discussion, if not for belief. And the, the ending point I thought was really relevant that, you know, we don't have a, a disability epidemic in the United States, or maybe we do, maybe health economists will tell me we do, but it doesn't seem that way. But we do have a policy lever that allows us to really change whether people are in the labor force and by how much they're in the labor force, the intensive margin. And I think the main takeaway from this paper is we changed a program, it seems like a modest change. You just include people who have type 2 diabetes, and you get these enormous effects not only in enrollment, but pretty uh, significant effects in labor force participation and earnings. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. We have time for uh, 10 minutes. Mike. One, one really quick comment and two questions. The quick comment is I, I learned in my, my first year econ class when I was a freshman in college, the professor said, you can resubmit an exam if you want it to be graded, but your grade could go up or down. And it seems like in this case, I assume your rating can only go up. And it, it seems to have deterred a lot of people. I've never had a student submit an exam because, and there's only with these people, you know, it's, uh, you might decide differently. But, but this is standard comes. Mark, I thought you, I think you said when you were discussing 
an Institute of Medicine study or something, that, that some of this had to do with people who worked in the factories that made the stuff? Did you say that? Work in the factories? The, that, did you say that about the people who made Agent Orange being part of this study of diabetes? No, no, no. There was a study that regressed, did you work in a facility that manufactured a Agent Orange? That was an explanatory variable. And on the left was, do you have diabetes? And there was a modest, significant positive on that, which was used as su suggestive evidence of a causal link between the two. And that is part of what formed the basis for this um, IOM report. But we don't think that's valid, or we have no idea? I haven't, I haven't gone in and sort of done, I haven't given, done sort of a mini referee report on the paper. The only thing, I was, think, the only thing I was thinking is if, if, if there is something to that and, and we could identify the people from these firms oh, right, as, right, a, yeah, I as can't, a control I can't group, because they, they had, if they had right. similar exposure but not the same program, right, right, it might right. be interesting, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, I guess the other question, real quick, in this relates to, some, to what Mary said, I, I was struck by your comment that SSA does, you know, just believe there's no labor supply response. But I'm trying to figure out if this is just a cool labor supply experiment because it's a non-debilitating disability, or it actually speaks to whether if you put incentives in place for people who have a real disability, it changes their behavior, which seems to be what you characterize as the debate between economists and SSA. I'm going to let Mark take this right. since this is his paper, but I want to crack at this if, uh, if he doesn't say everything I was going to say. Yeah, I mean, so I just want to thank first before even answering that, just thank Mary for the comments. I mean, they were great, and I think we are eager to try to. Um, actually, I'm flying out to West Point for my first time ever to, in a few weeks to try to do more, get more data to try to look at the dynamics of this as people sort of reapply and and uh, you know, appeal and so forth um, to sort of understand this. But I think there are some things that we can do with our existing data to get at this issue of is it sort of primarily driven by people who are on the program for the first time versus people who were on it and get a promotion. Because I think there's likely a nonlinear relationship between income benefits from this and labor force participation. Maybe getting a 200 a month, going from zero to 200 is very different maybe from going from 900 to 1100. Maybe 1100 gives you enough where you can drop out of the labor force, but that first 200 doesn't. But as for, uh, is it a cool, I, I mean, I think it's both. Uh, I think it's a cool <laughs> experiment, and I also think that it is uh, a, 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 of change. I mean, this is literally a, what might have seemed at the time like a pretty minor lever. Like, okay, we're going to cover potentially diabetes, and diabetes typically gets rated at only 10 or 20 percent in the VA system, and it you know, unleashed a pretty big effect on, I think, people's behavior, both in labor supply and, and applying for the program. So uh, I think it's, and I think it does get at these general issues. I mean, v DC is a different program from SSDI, but I think you know the SSDI trust fund is going to run out in two years, um, and there will be discussion of reforms. And it's not like I want to generalize from this to say, but I think that these programs, research that I've done, that Nicole's done, that Mary's done, that many others have done, indicates that there are behavioral, big behavioral effects of these programs. And whether those, I mean, maybe they're not generous enough. Maybe we should make them even, like, I, I, I think we're, it is, uh, if you want to understand, though, what is driving the labor market behavior of, let's say, near elderly men in the U.S., like a third or more of whom are veterans, I think this, what's happened with this program is a big part of it. Um, so uh, it is, uh, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, Can I add one more thing about this? Because I, I think, David, you asked me this question while we, Mark was talking. You know, increasingly, SSDI awards are being made on conditions where people believe there's some residual work capacity, or at least individuals like those individuals are working in the population. So whether you have, you know, a back pain or you have um, mental impairments that don't prohibit you from, from working. So I think the type 2 diabetes is a relevant example for when you think of a population getting on DI who might have some residual functional capacity. And so that's the way in which I think it's a relevant exercise. It's not completely generalizable, but it does speak to some of these behavioral impacts and, and what you can get from a program when you change levers that seem modest and, and have big consequences. And SSDI, so the award rate for cancer, heart attack, stroke from the mid-1980s to now, essentially no change. Musculoskeletal conditions, the most common of which is back pain, the award rate, just awards in the numerator, insured population in the denominator is six times higher. It is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a dramatic change in that program. Okay, uh, Devon is next, then Andrew. I have a quick comment. One more comment, and that's it. Uh, oh, sure. I, enjoy, I enjoyed the uh, presentation. I think the visuals were very 
uh, clean. Um, I had a, I have a question about the, it seems like the debate is about the size of the labor force participation response or the labor supply response. Um, I guess my question is, if it's bigger, is it small? Are we, how do we say whether that's good or bad? I mean, um, I guess my question is, it seems like we're trading off this tax revenue that we're giving to people versus them reducing their labor supply. And it seems like in order to know whether that's good or not, we need to know their disutility of labor supply. And, you know, does that more than compensate for the money that we're, you know, spending into the program? And it seems like that's almost an additional layer beyond whether or not there's a labor force supply or a labor participation response or not. What's the value of that leisure? to the people who are in these programs or not. And I guess depending on, is there a way, or how do we uh, um, you know, get at that measurement? Yeah, I think that is, uh, we're probably not gonna be able to get at that with, this, with these administrative data sets, but I think that it represents you know, a really important area to think about the trade-offs. There's sort of pluses and minuses associated with you know, when you make a program more generous. There's recent research on things like EITC and food stamps, for example, a lot of the previous research had looked at like labor supply disincentives of these programs, and others have looked at, let's say, health benefits for kids or you know, other things. So I think extending this to, to look at a broader set of outcomes beyond just the ones that are likely to be distorted to include things that are likely to benefit. And you know, measuring utility, as you know, is no notoriously difficult in programs like this. I mean, John Bound and Julie Cullen and some others have a paper in which they try to get at this question of the optimal generosity level of SSDI. Diamond, this goes, you can go all the way back to Diamond and Shashinsky. They have a theoretical model thinking about inc that incorporates type one and type two error. So I can't do justice to that question here, but I think that's a direction that we want to go in to say on that, is this a, a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, to some extent, if you think people are forward looking, uh, this may affect the willingness of people to serve uh, uh, as vet you know, serve in the military. And so that, incorporating that may be an another important, so that, you know, when you endogenize that, how valuable is it to have a new subset of people willing to go into the military? It, 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 so it, it, it's a hard problem, but I think I agree that it's first order for us. Yeah, I guess I'm struck by the haphazard nature of qualifying this as uh, an in-theater problem. Uh, and it seems like it came down to one article in science uh, with one significant finding. And has the question been asked since? Was that true? Was that a good decision? I mean, <laughs> it's like you would think that you would think other, there's no process otherwise. I mean, I just run a regression. I find something and I declare it to be so. So I, I just, what, what, what is it? I, uh, sure, it sounds nice. I mean, why not? But, but why? I, I, yeah, I think that it's hard for me to get inside the uh, minds of the people who are on this. So there, there, it's an IOM panel that was charged with summarize, basically looking at all of the literature that had tried to tackle this question of, is there evidence of a link? Now, causal link is even, like, it, there's the different, so I, I think that, it, and then the, they came out with this report suggesting it does look like there's a link, and the VA said, we're going to go with that. Do we not explore that later to see if that was true? I mean, we have a lot more evidence now. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, that's a good, I, I don't know, I, I should talk with uh, my epidemiologist friends to try to see whether, I, I do think if you were to look at, uh, I, I think it's, it, I have never run the regression, let's say, from the National Health Interview Survey or another data set that has on the left, do you have diabetes? And on the right, are, did you serve in theater and these other variables? Um, and so I, do, I, I think that it's a, it, it is, it's a good question. And I don't know if, if there is going to be, if people are going to return to look at it. I'm not sure. So go, you'll go next. But well, let me just say one word, and then, then you go. Uh, I don't think it's a comment on this paper so much, but David Wise just completed this international comparison of disability insurance programs as part of his international comparison of Social Security. And just to remind you, I mean, the U.S. is a total outlier in that uh, the incidence of disability insurance has been going way up in the U.S. In almost every other country, it's been going down uh, throughout Europe and so forth. 
Uh, and uh, labor force participation has changed uh, in the U.S. relative to these other countries. And so um, uh, something's different here than there. And I, you know, I just uh, thought I, I, I don't have any details about that, but uh, uh, it's not like this is one of those phenomena that's going on everywhere. It's only going on here. May I make one comment about that? Yeah. Because I have looked into this uh, with Richard Burkhauser. And what you find in, in cross-national studies, if you dig into why this is true, it's that most of the countries other than the United States has already reformed their system. And they've recognized that these systems have behavioral effects. And then they've gone to uh, functional capacity as opposed to functional incapacity model. And you have to work until you have to prove through trying to work that you can't. So they've front-loaded all the. Um, the investments in trying to work and keeping people in the labor force and then only let a subset of people exit. So I think these programs were queued off. The irony of this is a lot of these program changes were queued off the research that's being done in the United States, but we have not followed uh, that path. Uh, sorry, I, I was wondering kind of David's question, but in a slightly different way. So I think we know from Nicole and Kathleen's work that the effects on labor force participation are just greater the, the less severe the disability is. And so in that sense, do you think that this effect would generalize to other types of expansions? And the, the second point was, um, I think pro possibly the effects are even larger than just the effects on the extensive margin if you were to look at the intensive margin responses. And have you been able to look at that at all, or? Um... Uh, so yeah, that, that, uh, great question. So I think the, uh, we're starting to look at the intensive margin stuff, trying to get at the sort of heterogeneity in the benefits. We're a little bit, it's a little bit hard to do that given the cell construction to get out sort of, you can't get, it's hard to get individual level estimates with these, uh, with these cells that we have. Um, but I think it is, um, you know, it, it, it's a sort of complement, I think, to the kind of work that, the, that Nicole and Kathleen and Alexi have done and, 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 and Eric French and Jay Song have done some work in this area too. What's tricky here is we have, and, and Mary sort of mentioned this, it's this hybrid where you've got some people going from zero to 120, you've got other people going from 900 to 1200, and so we have this sort of, and so I think for us, you can think of this underlying sort of on the horizontal axis benefit income on the vertical axis axis uh, are you working or not and we're moving different people on to on different points so it may be pretty flat in the zero to 100 but as people get promoted the labor supply effects could grow over time i mean I've, it, it's interesting that if you look at those cps estimates for 2010 to 2014 suggesting an eight percentage point difference so we're suggesting one-fifth of the growth in disability compensation is it, it ends up to leading to a lower labor force. But to the extent people get on the escalator and those effects later on grow, eight percentage points, we wouldn't get anything close to eight percentage points if you took our estimate. So this is much after our sample period. Remember, our sample period ends in 2007. Why is it the case that veteran males 55 to 64 eight percentage points less likely to work? Disability, you almost need, you need something much higher than minus 0.2. And so I think one of the things that I want to do too is look at the, the longer supply effects because I think this benefits in year T may be smaller, much smaller as we saw than benefits in year T plus five. And I, I think that may explain this escalator and getting right to Mary's point may, ex, may help reconcile why we're getting Point two, which is non-trivial and it's it's big, but why we're getting this eight percentage points? Because we to get eight percentage points with point two, we would need a forty percentage point increase in DC, which we don't have anything remotely like that. But we do have about eight percentage point. So, can I make an observation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that the biggest drop in labor force participation uh, since uh, two thousand has not been in this population that's been in the population between 16 and 24. That's, I mean, if you, if you do a picture of what's been happening to labor force participation in the last 15 years, the plummeting has been among young people, uh, prime age people between 25 and uh, 54 uh, has declined some, uh, and past age 62 there have been increases in labor supply compared with, uh, you know, the last 25 years. So it, if we want to explain a lot of that drop, the total drop, we have to explain why young people in particular have 
are participating a lot less than they used to. That's a, that's a different question. I, I mean, I think that's a good, that's a great point, but I think we're about sort of differential within the near right. elderly. But it's, it's, you're, you're explaining the prime age decline, I think. Yeah. And the late prime age yeah. decline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we need a line change. Thank you.